Well, welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead online forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today. And today we have a subject matter expert sitting in the hot seat who was actually willing to say, yeah, go ahead, ask me anything, you can't scare me. Yes. <laughs> and I've had wonderful conversations with Jatana before. So I think that we are in for a treat today. And our session lasts for a little under an hour. If you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guests and the attendees alike. But questions and comments are always welcome. This is not a one-way conversation. This is a conversation. So if there's anything you want to ask, please feel free. Speak up, raise your hand, just you know, shout it out. But if there's something you'd like to contribute anonymously, you can put it in the chat, and I will be happy to share it for you. Now, our topic today is how to safely transition to senior living during a pandemic. And I'm really excited to introduce our subject matter expert today. So let me tell you a little bit about her. First of all, Jatana Williams is the founder and the CEO of Beyond the Sky Solutions and teaching and growing senior care providers really is her passion. It, it helps her train the senior care providers and focusing on their areas of opportunity. With several years of healthcare experience working in a variety of settings that include primary care, skilled nursing facilities, rehabil rehabilitation services, hospice care, assisted living and sales, Jatana brings different perspectives into her educator and consulting passions. And with the BTSS approach, she's confident knowing that families and their loved ones are receiving services from caring and well-trained professional caregivers. So without further ado, Jatana, wave to everybody and say hello. Hi, hi. I got the granny look at you like, you know, teacher look today. <laughs> <laughs> That's so I can see what's going on like this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Welcome, welcome to the club. <laughs> Thank you. So, Jatana, um, expand a little bit on on the intro that I did because that was a very brief intro. But maybe tell us a little bit more about your background and what led you to start doing what you're doing now. Well, um, so I have started my journey in healthcare many, many years ago. I, I would say about 30 years now. And um, I started out in skilled nursing and um, it was actually not the greatest skilled nursing facility. Um, and within a year's time of working there, they actually closed it down. And um, in that time, I, I saw some things that made me think, you know, care has to be delivered better than this, you know? Um, so I went from different departments, working in the hospitals and so forth, and my last journey was working in hospice, and um, which I really, really loved, um, being there for people at the end of life and having them have a peaceful transition is one of the, the most um, loving experiences that you can have in your life. Um, so I just decided to start this journey with Beyond the Sky Solution, not by plan, but by call. Um, I actually was called uh, by some friends who said, can you help us when I had quit my last job? It was a corporate job. And, um, and they said, can you come give us a hand? And as I started giving them a hand, I realized that God actually called me to do what I'm doing, and so here we are. So we help people to stay compliant with the regulations set forth before them in senior care um, and adult care for those who are disabled. And we also do consulting services um, to help people start a business in this arena, as well as we have consultants that help the families to transition into the best place for them. And that is truly important to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I can see where the idea of it, it being a calling is, is so critical. And it's the difference between quality of care and just warehousing 
people. Yes. You no. Know? And yes. in our experience, um, because we went through this with both sets of parents, you know, in terms of looking for support, graduating levels of support and so forth. And, and there were always, I have to say the majority of the people truly were called to do what they were doing, but there was always that one or two <laughs> that you thought, surely you can do something else. <laughs> yes, they're just getting a paycheck. Yes. Yeah. And that's something that I, I enjoy being able to help um, owners when they hire staff to really weed out those people that are there just for a paycheck and help them find what's right for them. Mm -hmm. Because caring for people is, is critical and it's such an important piece of, of our aging journey is to get good care. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So in, in your business, you, you both offer those services to families who are trying to figure out what to do, yes. as well as training other people how to do what you do. Yes. I assume, right? Yes. And then, you know, making some connections between other people with, with families. Is that right? Yeah. So basically, um, say, for example, if you were to call me and you said, you know, I need help with my mother, for example. And, you know, I would sit with you, talk to you about what's going on with your mother. And we actually have an assessment that we do. Um, it's a four page assessment when we talk with the families to really dig in and find out what's going on mm -hmm. so that we can direct you to the right service, whether it's home care, an assisted living, bringing in uh, different clinical services. So it's really important to know who is your loved one, who were they before the disease? Okay. You know, that's important. Mm -hmm. And making sure that they get the services they deserve. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it's really hands-on. Um, and so we work with different businesses to get that person exactly what they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. So um, I imagine, I, I know for, for us, when we very first started down the journey, uh, you don't know what you don't know, you know? And, and so it was, it was, very eye-opening. It was very um, confusing. It was um, shocking, you know, I would say. And so had we had somebody to help guide us, that would have made things just so much, so much better. So, so let's say that, that I've come to you and I've said, hey, I, I have a feeling that my, my mom and dad need a little bit of help. Where, where would you start the conversation? What are some of the things that you would ask? I would, I would ask questions such as, so tell me, why do you think that they need a little bit of help? Mm -hmm. Then you tell me what you think. Then I say, okay, tell me of some of the things that mom and dad are doing. Are they up at night? Are they wandering? Are they putting things in their mouth that they shouldn't? Are they putting, are they losing their keys if they're still driving? Um, are they putting the keys in the refrigerator or the stove? Um, are there things happening that prohibits an individual from continuing their activities of daily living, the things that with the eating and the dressing and the toileting? So I will just start with, tell me about what's going on with mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And then I will kind of direct the conversation from there of the things that I really need to dig into and know. Mm -hmm. Tell me of a typical day for mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And that usually gets some stuff going. <laughs> They'll get some things opening up. Mm -hmm. And it probably becomes a decision tree from there, right? If they're, oh, if they're doing this, then we might look at that, you know, sort of. Yes, thing. because sometimes people will think mom and dad needs help um, when it might be that they need to go back to the doctor, get the medications adjusted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mom might have a urinary tract infection and people often confuse that for some, from some form of dementia because it has the same type of symptoms, the confusion, disorientation, uh, agitation. So people will sometimes label someone as, oh my gosh, I think, you know, mom's got Alzheimer's when it could be meds or an infection. 
So sometimes I have to direct people back to the doctor and, 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 and empower them with different questions to ask the physician. So that, that, you know, so it depends on what's happening to which direction I will gear someone. But we have to work really close with the, with the doctors or get a specialist, you know, involved. So it's, it's so big. <laughs> it's right. so big. Right. And you have to be willing to um, dig and find out what's really going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because I think uh, when you don't know what you don't know, you have in your mind what the solution is, mm -hmm. you know. And um, I know with, with my parents, um, once my brother and I had to get involved in their medical care and start going to the doctor with them to find out what the doctor said and that kind of stuff. That was the first time that, that I think I realized, Hey, there's a difference between a doctor who specializes in senior care mm -hmm. and just a doctor, yeah. you know, because until we, until that light bulb came on, you know, they'd been seeing the same doctor and it was the same prescriptions and the same treatment and so forth until we finally started questioning, is this really appropriate for somebody in their 80s or right. you know, is this appropriate for somebody who's almost 90 or do you really think you ought to be driving or, you know, all of that. So that was a huge change to actually get a doctor who, who his focus was, was seniors. Yes, there's a lot of wonderful geriatric physicians out there in the world. Um, that people don't even know exist, that they get extra schooling and education specifically for caring for our elderly. So, and then even from, from their point, um, they might even refer the family to a neurologist mm -hmm. if there's some memory issues. And then you have to have this continuum of, of care and a, you know, a team of people working together to get the right solution for an individual. Because mm -hmm. like you said, Patty, sometimes um, doctors will order things that is not, it is not a necessity for a 90 year old um, or it doesn't add to their quality of life. Yes. And that's what we're focused on, the quality of life for that person, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to that person? Right. It's not one size fits all for sure. No, no. Cause what I think is best for my mom, she'll tell you something different. <laughs> Shout a <laughs> <it> doubt. <laughs> so we always have to look at it from their eyes, you know, from the actual person's eyes that what would they want if they can't speak for themselves any longer or remember what, what do we know about them that we can help drive um, the best care yeah. for them, to them, you know? Yeah. So those of us who have joined us in this call, I want to make sure you feel free to, to ask any questions you might have. Just, um, you know, speak out anything that you, you ask. We've got, we've got a brilliant subject matter expert sitting here. So don't let your, your questions go unanswered. Exactly. Exactly. Um, I know that during this time of COVID, a lot of people are really uh, afraid, you know, and, you know, fear has good things that have, you know, fear can drive you to get things done because, you know, if I don't get this done, X, Y, Z is going to happen. And then fear can paralyze you mm -hmm. and, and keep you from making a move. And, and what I tell people when it comes to making a move for their loved one during this time of COVID is you have to look at the alternative. You know, um, what is happening with your, your father right now? And what are the, the worst risks, you know, that can happen if he stayed home with no supervision throughout the day because you're at work? Or, um, you know, what could he fall? Could he catch the house on fire? You know, you have to look at all of the things that are happening to your dad to consider, okay, it would be safer for him to be in an assisted living or a memory care setting with people that can lay eyes on him and monitor his medication 
and talk to the physicians versus we don't know what will happen over here. Because either way, you know, um, with COVID, you know, you're more likely to catch the COVID over at home with people coming in and out, the grandkids and everybody else coming in and out, and they don't even know their carriers, than you are in a setting where they're being mindful of uh, cleaning and disinfecting and washing hands and, and, and all the things that required of them in the state level. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the thing about COVID is nobody really has enough knowledge. <laughs> it's different from day to day. Yeah. So when you know your loved one needs some extra help, then you just have to make that move safely. Right. You know, make it right. safely. Right. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, a, uh, it's a, a cost benefit analysis, you know, like you said, the difference between what are they exposed to at home is versus what are the, you know, the, the cons necessarily of moving them into some sort of care. Can you speak to um, what they're doing in some of the facilities as far as trying to protect, you know, how do I put this? So, so it's like, I realize that, you know, they're not letting outside people come in and visit their families as much, or they're doing it through the windows, or they're only doing it outside, or all of those kinds of things. But what about all of the workers that work there, the people that come and go all the time? Yes. So they're, they're doing daily temperature checks. Um, they're doing uh, monitoring surveys. Um, you know, if they had two days off, where were you? Um, mm -hmm. There have been a lot of people that haven't been able to go back to their job working in assisted living because say they went someplace <laughs> and that was high risk. Well, no, you can't come back to work. Right. So they're doing the best that they can to uh, monitor and, and temperature check and ask them where they've been to keep people safe. They're making them wear masks. They're making them wear gloves. Um, a lot of places, um, they, if there are bigger buildings, they assign caregivers to a certain section. And so that caregiver is only in that section. And then the caregiver is only in this section and they're keeping people separate there. So it's a big production for the larger assisted living. Um, it's not as stressful for the smaller six bed places that are called boarding care homes. Right. Um, but they are monitoring and staying on top of those things, mm -hmm. um, which has caused a lot of the owners and operators challenges when they don't allow people to come back to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine because it's not like they're, um, they've got a ton of people working there to begin with. You know, it seemed in our experience, it's like they were always shorthanded, that that was always, you know, a, a challenge. Yeah, and that's why it's important to, to know the place that you're going to be taking your mom or dad. Um, you know, there's many companies that do what I do, um, that actually hold your hand and help you to maneuver. Some really great people um, all over the, the country that do uh, placement services. Um, so you'll want to work with a company that really knows the different buildings really well, and they're more concerned about what your needs are versus who they refer you to. Um, you know, that they have knowledge of what's happening in that building. Have they had a COVID outbreak? Uh, you know, what is their caregiver to resident ratios? You know, these are things that you'll want to know about who you're working with to help you find something. Um, and then when you actually start working with them, you want to ask them a lot of questions about the places they recommend. Right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, that, it seems like in today's um, situation, today's scenario, having some help with that is more important than ever because I know for us, we went and just did unannounced visits. We didn't set appointments. We just showed up and yeah. wanted to see what it looked like when they weren't putting on a show. And, yeah. and that was super helpful because it helped us weed out some places that we were definitely not going to, to consider. 
but you can't do that now. You know, you, you, <laughs> you can't do that. No, now they're doing virtual tours. Um, a lot of them will sit on the computer and show you pictures and things. But like you said, Patty, uh, they might be showing you pictures of their best day. <laughs> you know, their best time, their best day, you know, when they were all smelling good and their best, you know. Yeah. Um, and not necessarily um, being truthful and honest about their tough days. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a question you want to ask them over the phone since you can't physically see them is to ask them, um, how are you managing COVID-19? Mm -hmm. You know, what is your, can you send me your COVID-19 plan? Any place that is worth their salt won't mind sharing what their plan is. Yeah. You know, um, uh, how are you, how do you manage when you're, you're short of staff? Right. What is your plan? You know, ask them the tough questions. Um, and that's why having people like uh, my company and others to, to help with those things, um, because it is difficult to know what to ask all the time. Mm -hmm. But the magic hour, Patty, is 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. <laughs> for the drop-ins. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the magic hours. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, I remember when we when we were first starting this journey um, that one of the the place where my parents ultimately went their their first stop um, was just a wonderful place. And and the director, the woman who was the director there, she was just fabulous. I mean, she was like a you. You know, you could pick up the phone and call her, and and she would you know talk through anything with you, but. One of the things that she said to us was, you know, food is very important to them. The food that they're going to eat, where they eat, when it's served, how it's served. They said, you know, their whole world just kind of begins to evolve around meals and stuff. So with in this state, I mean, because they sat family style, you know, like four, six to a table, whatever. What are they doing now for something like that? Yes, that the meal times have completely changed because it used to be in many places, open dining, uh, some places a full buffet, mm -hmm. you know, now they've had to cut that out. Um, now they are doing social distancing in the dining rooms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, alternations with the schedule of when people eat, um, so it's not overcrowded. So that has had to change for them, as well as for us on the on the outside, like with the restaurants and so forth. So unfortunately, they haven't been able to keep it the same. Mm -hmm. um, in the smaller six beds, they've been able to keep it the same because it's only six residents. Right. So it's not as much as a, as of a stress um, with the social distancing and too many people as it is with the larger home uh, assisted living buildings. Mm -hmm. So social distancing, changing of the schedule with the meals, uh, it has had to change, unfortunately. Right, right. Wow, so much to consider. It was a big job before. And yeah. now, you know, now adding this on. Um, can you speak a little about, um, about Alzheimer's and dementia and some of the, the impacts that maybe that is having on this? Yes. Um, it's already, um, tough for someone that has some form of dementia to be in an isolated situation. So depending on what type of dementia a person may have will depend on the behaviors that they will exhibit. Um, so it's very important for an assisted living to know uh, a true diagnosis of what dementia so they know how to address the behaviors. So for example, if somebody had um, Alzheimer's with Lewy body, attacked. Lewy body is known to be more of an aggressive uh, type of dementia where they have aggression um, and they might be a little more physical with hallucinations um, versus somebody with Parkinson's that may not exhibit uh, so much of the behaviors. 
So in a situation with COVID, it's important for the team at the assisted living to have a really uh, tight care plan on how to take care of that individual based off of the type of dementia they have. So for example, if you have, we'll just say like uh, Mr. Smith, for example, Mr. Smith, um, he likes to go outside and he, he likes to go for walks. Well, then the, the team really has to work hard to put Mr. Smith on a schedule where they can get him out for walks so it doesn't trigger him having behaviors or being combative. Mm -hmm. So them knowing what type of dementia is very important in the care planning process, especially now with COVID, um, having to have them separate from each other so much and they're not understanding why, you know, Mr. Smith, he's used to going and, and giving Betty a hug in the morning, you know, hey, Betty, and now he can't. You know, it's more difficult to um, manage that. So they have to alternate schedules if they know that, that Mr. Smith and Betty like to do that in the morning. Yeah. And they have to have a caregiver give him a little more love and attention, you know, mm -hmm. so that he understands that, you know, it's nothing you've done. You're safe. Yes. You know, you're safe. You're safe. Because um, the word safe is a word we all need to use with all of our elderly um, when we're trying to provide care for them. So it's a big job. But knowing the kind of dementia, and that's like a whole other class, like I I teach an eight hour class to professionals in this arena, just breaking down the different types of dementia. Um, <laughs> there's so many of them. Yes. And they have different behaviors, but knowing what kind does help. Yeah. Does help in the care. It really does. Yeah. My um, father was in a, a memory care facility uh, up to his passing. And I have tried to imagine that place right now, you know, because as much as possible, they tried to give them freedom, you know, to move about and so forth, you know, and, and that, that, uh, that word safe was really important. And I remember hearing the caregivers say that multitudes and multitudes of times, but to not be able to, to do that now in this, in this time, um, I just can't imagine the confusion that must reign in those those poor people's minds. Yeah, it's um because you have to think a lot of them, depending on what type of dementia, are trapped in their thoughts and their fears. Yeah. Um. So we have to keep them away from media. You know, don't allow them to. We have to block the channels to the news right now. I mean, it it seems like we're being crude by not giving them that freedom, but um, different behaviors and anxieties are set off by different things that we allow. So um, something as simple as watching the news and seeing all the violence with the protests and things like that could set a person with dementia into hallucinations. Yes. And, yes. and then the caregivers spend the whole night trying to calm them down and they're saying, no, they're coming to get me. They're shoot, you know, they're shooting, they're doing this. You know, so we as family caregivers, as professional caregivers, we have so much power in uh, prohibiting those different things from being triggered by the things that we do and that we allow them to have access to. Mm -hmm. So, you that know. That is huge. That's a huge point. And um, I know my, my father, um, they did not, uh, manage what they saw on TV, either in the big room or in their own individual rooms. And he, he called my brother in the middle of the night one night and said that there was a shooting outside his door. Yeah. And he was, he goes into this great detail. And finally, my brother realized he was describing something he had seen on TV. Yeah. So right now, oh my gosh, that would just be yeah, it's so imperative for us to monitor the TV for them. I mean, even block 
the channels. I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, give them old, you know, let them watch old movies, uh, let less violence. Um, truly things trigger, things trigger their behaviors. Mm -hmm. And with COVID right now, I mean, it causes all of us anxiety. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, the how many people have COVID? How many people died? Can we open? No, we can't open. I mean, that's enough for us. Yeah. So someone with dementia is really on edge. <laughs> you know, I want to go watch Hallmark movies. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so there is a question in the chat. Um, and and this comes from one of our one of our attendees here who is is uh, a musician and does this as a service and and her question is is there any ways currently that people are providing music as a service in assisted living or as a way of yes. helping folks you know calm down and yes they are um they're doing quite a few things actually so a lot of the um a lot of the larger and some smaller um, assisted living, they have contracts with music therapists um, that regularly come in. So they they treat them the same way they would an employee with taking their temperature, where have they been, and things of that nature. Now, I do know for a particular person um, that goes into diff goes into different buildings for a different type of service. Um, one of the companies canceled her contract because they didn't want her going into other buildings and then coming into theirs. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they gave her the option of, you know, either you just do our building or we have to cancel. So that kills her business. So she had to say no, but she still goes to the other businesses and provides the service. So yes, music is a big part of um, bringing calmness, bringing joy. Uh, some of them have allowed music therapists to play on the piano, uh, um, um, not piano, I'm sorry, patio. <laughs> play on the patio and bring the residents towards the window, you know, out to look outside their window. They'll play out front in the courtyards. You know, they do different things to still bring some kind of joy to them musically, mm -hmm. as well as art as well. You know, art therapy is huge in assisted living world. Yeah, yes, that's beautiful. That That is truly beautiful. And I know that um, they respond to music. Not only is it calming, but it's kind of like a, it's a language that, that everybody speaks and, you know, it takes them back to a, a different place. Yes, yeah. yes, especially if they have some memory impairment. There's been uh, different cases where someone uh, would hear the piano playing and then they would sit down and start playing the piano. Mm. Uh, and people in their family didn't even know they could play, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's things hidden because we have to remember with dementia that our long-term memory stays around um, much longer than our short-term memory. Mm -hmm. So our short-term memory is the here, right now, what did I have to eat, where am I, versus when I was a child growing up. So that long-term memory gets pulled out with music, and it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Very beautiful thing. Yeah. I want to pause here just a second in case anybody on the, the phone uh, or in the on the phone. I feel like I just stepped back to 1980. If anyone in, in our Zoom call here has a comment or a question to ask, so I'm going to just pause for just a second here. Hi, Susan. <laughs> We've met once, haven't we? Yeah. <laughs> Can't hear you, Susan. That's Okay, there now does that work? Great. I keep forgetting I plugged in an external mic. <laughs> okay, hi, Jatana. Hi. What, greetings. greetings. Remind me again what area you predominantly work in, or you just kind of travel a wide uh, area? San Diego and South Orange and South Riverside and a little bit in the desert. Okay, got it. 
Um, and so um, what facilities are allowing musicians at this point in the orange area? Well, um, I don't have a list to come out of my head at this moment, but there are a variety of the larger assisted living. So I would say if you are really wanting to um, provide what you do, which is very important, that you would want to just reach out to um, their activities department, right. different buildings, and let them know what you do. I mean, yeah. And because a lot of them have contracts with people. Okay, I am so encouraged to hear because frankly, I played, um, had arrangement and played at one location and that was, and then they got concerned. The people that ran the facility got concerned. It's probably extra cautious. Mm -hmm. And I played outside. You played outside? <laughs> I played outside. And, um, but the concern was the windows were open. So um, that was a concern. So, but anyway, I'm so encouraged to hear that there are facilities that are allowing it. Yeah, because they still have to provide some stimulation for people. You right. know, we can't forget that people, um, we have a need to interact in life. And, that, and that's exactly. part of the reason why so many people are upset with businesses being closed, like gyms and spas and you know because it's so important for us to still live life even in the midst of chaos you know so life was created for us to enjoy and that's what we want to still bring to our elderly in a safe way exactly possible yeah definitely so if i were you i would definitely let them know how you what, what your plan is to be um, to help them to feel secure. Okay. All right. That makes, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. That makes so much sense. Um, two other questions I did have one, have you ever worked with a client who, um, was formerly a nurse, a geriatric nurse, and it's, and it only knows how to be the care giver, not the care receiver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so they say doctors make the worst patients. Yes. <laughs> yes. Doctors, nurses. Um, well, it depends on do you mean like trying to provide them the care or is there a specific area? Um, that that they're they're a little well i think it's you know i'm i'm grateful at this point it's my mom and come close a few times thinking that we're going to have to go down that road but if it ever does get to that point where she really can't be on her own i know it's going to be a struggle is she a nurse yes yeah and she's oh. been yeah yeah, so one of the things is, is she is she experiencing memory issues? I would say yes. And some cognitive things and but she's still living on her own and still driving, but she lives in Arizona. So it's a little bit easier. But oh, if yeah, you're right. outside of an area that's not on a grid system it's a different world. Yeah. Well, um, I can tell you that with my mother, when we were concerned about her driving, uh, we told her we were taking the car to get it um, mechanic work. And it just never came back. You know, so that's how we, <laughs> we managed with taking my mother's car. <laughs> Um, so people get a little creative with that when it's been a, when it's a dangerous situation, you have to get a little creative with how you take their, cause a car give takes away their independence. Yeah. You know, and, and she's um, like ultra when it comes to in the independent scale, she's like very, very, very independent. Yeah. So with her, you might want to just start off with. Um, some, if she needs the help, 
some caregiving to come in the home with some home care just a couple of times a week to help her out with a few things to not take away her full independence because living in assisted living isn't for everybody. Um, and she might be one of those people that can stay home and just get a little help. I knew a 104 year old who was still cooking, still driving when I met her. And the only reason why we needed to place her somewhere was because she had fallen, but she had not been to the doctor. And I think it was like 60 years. And she told me the only reason why she needs to go to the assisted living now was because she saw a doctor and now they want to put her somewhere. So she never had medications. You, most independent 104 year old I've ever, you know, just wow. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. He passed soon after that from the, you know, because of the, the, the things that happened from the fall, you know, um, but we don't want to take away anything that they can do safely on their own. Yeah. So maybe some home care will help. Yeah. And I think maybe, um, involving them in the conversation somewhat too, if they can be involved, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, somebody was talking, I, I was listening to a podcast the other day that said, how would you feel like, you know, us at, at our age, or how would you feel if somebody made these decisions for you, right. and put you out? And, and they were speaking specifically in terms of, of COVID, like people deciding, oh, my mom can't be by herself because of COVID. I need to pick her up out of her life and put her in mine so I can take care of her. And, and the mom was like, I don't want to go live in your house. It's too crazy. It's too noisy. It's, I want to stay right where I am. But. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, if, you, if they're, if they are able to still make their own decisions, we really can't do anything but what they want. Yeah. You know, um, it's only when they're deemed that they're unable to make their own decisions where we just kind of take the ball and run with it. But even then, like Patty said, we do want to include them in the conversation. We never want to talk over them or talk as if they're not there. We have to remember these are our parents. These are the people that have paved the way for us. And we need to respect them and give them dignity, yeah. um, you know, in their choices. So, you know, um, it's funny because I, I took my mom to a little gathering they had at assisted living a while ago. Um, and um, she knew exactly what I was up to. So, <laughs> cause I thought, you know, let her, let her taste it out a little bit, you know, see what it's all about. You know, she knew what was going on. <laughs> so it, it, going somewhere is not for everybody. It might be just staying at home, you know, so. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yes, most definitely. <laughs> and one of the key things that I think when you are um, considering any place right now, I, I have to say again, ask them what their COVID-19 plan is. What are they doing to, to prevent an outbreak in their assisted living? And, you know, have they had an outbreak? How many people have COVID? Do they have isolation precautions? You know, there are some um, key questions that you'll want to, to ask. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's, that's good. You can always email me and I can give you the questions to ask. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, in fact, can you put your email in the chat? Oh, sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I can do it for you, Jatana, so that you can. Oh, I got it. it. Boom, there we go. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yes, and I'll put my phone number as well. She also has a great website, that btss.co, that has lots of resources, lots of articles, uh, lots of things to consider, you know, that's on there. Yes, for sure. I want to be a resource. Um, I have consultants. Um, that work with families 
you know, so it's not all just me. I have a talented team, a caring team of individuals who have physically walked into these places so they know what they're all about. They know the people, um, you know, and because we do education, we have great relationships with the owners and operators. Mm -hmm. So definitely um, love what I do. <laughs> love what I do. And I always, you know, when I think about putting, uh, you know, and I hate to say the word putting, but uh, moving someone into a place, I, I think about my mom and my dad. And I think what I want my mom or dad to get care here. And if I can't confidently say yes, then it's yes. So. Those are the best kinds of service providers or, you know, people who have either walked that walk or are contemplating it themselves too. Yes. My father-in-law um, was, he, he honestly was not experiencing any signs of dementia. We didn't think um, mm -hmm. until, but, but he had cancer and, um, and he had emphysema. So he, he was not very well. And so we had hospice working with him. He was still in his own home. And they called us, um, I, I'll never forget this. They called us the Wednesday before Thanksgiving and said, your dad doubled up on his medication. We need to make a decision now. He needs more care. He needs oversight. He needs, you know, so we were like on a holiday weekend. Yeah. Like, what do we do? And, and it, was, it was the funniest thing because we had actually been looking for places um, before his wife died because she wanted to move and he didn't want to. So we already had kind of a list of places we were thinking about and we started sharing this with him and he was adamantly opposed to everything. No, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want that. And then he said, but I would go live in, in a, a home, a house, a board and care, you know, which he was a little bit antisocial, you know, and we were like, what? Yeah. yeah. Are you kidding me? But they're kind of in each other's space in a, a boarding yeah. house. So yeah. we, the hospice people gave us, a, gave us three places to go take a peek at. And we took them out to one. All of this is Thanksgiving weekend, bear in mind. This is like Wednesday night. So we go and we look at this one. And, uh, and it was beautiful. It was really great. But he he didn't like it for some reason. And we went to another one and he didn't like that one. And then we went to the third one and he was like, I like it here. I really like it here. And, and we had no idea why there was no rhyme or reason for why that one over another one, but they were wonderful. They were so gracious. They took him in the next day and uh, it was, it was just wonderful. It's so interesting. I've had, I've had people, um, make a decision based off of that there were cute little men in the lobby area <laughs> and they thought their mom would really like that. <laughs> well, the, the first place we took him to that I really liked um, and thought he would like, that was one of the things he said, it was all females. And I said, <laughs> Bill, you know, you'll, you, you'll be the most popular guy here. And he's like, oh no. <laughs> Well, everybody, this has been really great. I want to just open up any last questions or comments that we might have uh, for Jatana while, um, while we still got her here and got her full attention. Any other last comments or questions? Well, I just, I just want to say that um, if you do have questions, please contact 888 uh, 2941488. You can put in my extension 101 to get directly to me. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or send you those questions that you can ask an assisted living or a memory care. I'm more than happy to do that. Um, just know that that these are businesses as well, and they're held to standards way above what regular businesses are held to right now with the COVID. They have to manage um, the Department of Social Services, Community Care Licensing, Department of Health, OSHA, <laughs> and the governor. So, <laughs> and keep up with the color chart. So, 
there's so many rags on these people that I, I just have to tell you, you know, you take precaution like you would at any other point in time, you know, but never let COVID stop you from making a decision to move your loved one if that is going to help them have a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. Good, good ending comment there, Jatana. <laughs> so I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to share really, really important information. I mean, these are difficult decisions that we make. And as we get to a certain stage in our life, these are decisions that we have to make for the people that have always made decisions for us. So yeah. it's very emotional and it's very difficult. And so um, I really thank you for taking the time to be here with us. Anyone who listens to this either live or, or in the replay, please reach out to Jatana. Um, her website is btss.co. You can reach her at 888-294-1488. And just uh, anything that you need to know, she is your resource. So, and thank you to all of those who joined us today. And I look forward to the next time that we are on another Ask Me Anything with yet another brilliant smarty pants in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful day. You guys stay safe. God bless.